Mike Staley Podcast. Episode 596. It's Tuesday, November 12th, 2013. Yes, that's 11 12 13. 9 p.m. Pacific Time, Internet Talk Radio for your imagination. Mike Matthews broadcasting from the last place on earth located somewhere in Podcaster Valley, California. Today, Ruta Vega, Valentina, Bison Bentley. Into an interview, Nick Sikirsky, an archivist at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Mike's Daily Podcast. He's going to talk about some things that have to do with history. Mike's Daily Podcast. He's really smart and he makes history come alive, but not in a cheesy cable channel way. Oh, there was a couple of things that I wanted to say, and that is my friend Mike Ockett likes to text me pictures of places where he likes to go and get faces. He likes to go on those microbrewery bus tours. Mike's Daily Podcast. And he sent me a lot of pictures from said tour over the weekend. It was nice to see all those pictures. Thanks, Mike. Mike's It's so great that Daily I have a friend that has my podcast. exact same name. Yeah! Because I don't ever forget it. Hey, wanted to share something with you. I am sick of the fat jokes with Chris Christie. Okay, I know a lot of people like to make fun of him because he's overweight, but I think that's stupid and it's a cheap shot. It is the cheapest joke you can make is of someone's weight. I used to get so perturbed on, on the liberal side of people making fun of Michael Moore. Yeah, he's overweight. Don't make that the stupid cheap joke you go to. George Christie, Mike, Michael Moore. Criticize them, make jokes about other things that have to do, you know, what they do, not how they look. That's just a cheap shot, shallow school kid playground. And I hate that. As soon as I start seeing, I mean, they do that even on The Daily Show, Comedy Central, they're making fun of it. I'm like, okay, we get it. You guys are far smarter comedy writers than that, unlike myself. Oh, look, who just walked in? Hello, Michael Matthews. This is Madame Ruta Vega. I want to thank you for standing up for the fat people of the world. You're welcome. I am so upset, too. You're upset, too? Yes. It's like, okay, in the 90s, people made fun of Roseanne Barr. And the jokes just got just... Before that, Dom DeLuise. Before that, you know, Laurel and Hardy, the bigger one of the two. You know, Stop. We're not third graders here. Actually, Michael Matthew, I am a third grader. You are? But you, you're, you're immortal. You've been around all these centuries. And you're finally getting to third grade? I've been busy. Look who else just walked in. Hello, oh, damn, Mike. This is Valentino, the parking attendant. And this is Bison Bentley. Do you know that? Mike, we don't like George Christ. I mean, Chris Christie. Who's George Christie? Oh, he was the head of the Hells Angels in... Um, Ventura, California. Why I remember that, I don't know. Anyway, go on. We don't like Chris Christie because he's not a tea party. He's a Republican, but not a tea party. Day. Yeah, we love the tea party. Do you know that? Well, you guys, you know, he has a chance at winning the presidency. That's what they're saying anyway. The media is touting that. So, you know, perhaps you should throw your weight. I didn't go there. I kind of went, but I didn't go behind him. Yeah, Mike, okay, whatever day. People were making fun of Dom DeLuise. I killed them. Day. Yeah, we don't take lightly to people making fun of Dom. God rest his soul. He was a great comedian. Loved him. Yeah, he was the best. Do you know that? Well, not too far away from George. Dang it, I did it again. Chris Christie's home turf. They have just finished the One World Trade Center Tower. Well, I mean, they haven't finished it, but it has been declared the highest in the U.S. The Council on Tall Buildings says the tower's spire is an integral part of the structure and should be counted, making the official height uh, 1,776 feet. Ooh, that is so patriotic. 1776. Wow. Yeah, we like that day because we're tea patty and we're patriotic day. Go tea patty. Man, you guys, tone it down. So building experts declared 
the new World Trade Center tower, the highest skyscraper in the country today, knocking Chicago's Willis Tower from the spot it has held for nearly 40 years and answering the burning question in high-rise circles. When is a long, pointy thing protruding protruding from a roof more than just a long, pointy thing? <clears throat> Which is a question I've been asking myself for a long time. So when it's a spire, that differentiates it from antennas, flagpoles, lightning rods, and other building additions that are purely functional and not part of the aesthetic design. Okay. Conceptually, from the architect's point of view, it's a major part of the building... So it is described as uh, the spire is described as a welcoming beacon because it has a light on it. And it's reminiscent of the Statue of Liberty's golden torch in a way, a light of memory. This, according to the L.A. Times dot com. One World Trade Center is not just the nation's tallest building, but the world's third highest behind the 2,722 foot Burj Khalifa building in Dubai and the 1,972 foot Mecca Royal Hotel Clock Tower in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. One World Trade Center should be complete in next year, early next year sometime, they are saying. Michael Massey, what a tremendous piece of history! Ooh. Yeah, that's pretty cool, Day. I want to go to the top of that building and look out over the great expanse of our nation, Day. We're tea parties and we're patriotic. Do you know that? That's great. Well, I hope you guys get a chance to do that. So what do you think about that being the tallest building in the world and beating out Chicago's big building, Willis Tower? And what do you think of fat jokes in general? You can email me. We read your comments on the section, emails from email. Email me at mikesdailypodcast at gmail.com. Also email me there if you'd like to be a guest on the show or if you would like to sponsor the show, mikesdailypodcast at gmail.com. Check out the website, mikesdailypodcast.com. It's where we got a bunch of cool links, like where to find us on Twitter, Yelp, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spreaker. Uh, Also going to be on prx.org's website. So if you have a radio station and you want this show on your radio station, by gosh, you can do it through prx.org. That's got a bunch of great shows on it. And we are on there now. Oh, there's also a link to where to find us on Facebook. Like our Facebook page. And when I post a new show, share that with your friends so that more people find out about us. Also, a link to iTunes where you can listen to the show in iTunes. Download us from there. You can rate and rank the show and comment on the show there in iTunes. Got a link to that. Also got the daily podcast picture and the blog. And there is another way to help out this show, and that is through the Amazon deal of the day. Click on the little window we got. And if you buy something through there, we got great discounts going on, all kinds of stuff on Amazon. And if you buy something through that portal on the website at mikesdailypodcast.com, it's a great way to support the show. And it's all there at mikesdailypodcast.com. Into an interview. Okay, let's call Nick Sikersky up on Skype and make the past come alive. Hey, Mike. Nick, good evening to you. How's the uh, the volume sounds all right? The volume sounds excellent. How do I sound? Oh, wait, I guess it doesn't matter how I sound to you. <laughs> as long as you can hear me. It sounds clear. Great. Nick Sikirsky. Did I say it right? Yeah, that's right. Welcome to Mike's Daily Podcast. Great. Thanks for having me on. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for being on. That was our massive applause from our massive studio audience, which is Basil the Boxer. Uh huh. <laughs> and to hear a dog clapping his hands is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. So, Nick, it is so good to talk to you, and we're going to talk about all kinds of things, including Herbert Hoover. Yeah, that's right. So, your website, just so that everybody knows, is Research Teacher. That's right, researchteacher.com. D- dot com. And it talks. Same. Same on Twitter, at Research Teacher. Ah, okay. And you are uh, working with uh, at Stanton University. Stanford U- Stanton? <laughs> what the hell? The Stanton, Ohio? Stanford, yeah. Stanford. Canton, right? <laughs> Canton is what Stanford I mean. Stanford University. 
Now that I, Stanford University, uh, and you work for the Hoover Institution. That's right. A- and um, it has to do with, well, what does it have to do? What is the Hoover Institution? So I'll give you a little background history and because uh, people might not have heard about it. So the Hoover Institution, it's a library, an archive, and also a public policy think tank. I know that's a lot of a mouthful there, but we're based at Stanford and we were founded by Herbert Hoover back in 1919. So this is a decade before he became the 31st president of the U.S. And uh, so we've been around for about 94 years. We collect historical documentation um, and we also have this public policy aspect of the institution, which um, kind of evolved over the years. So we have people like Condoleezza Rice, George Schultz, or fellows at the Hoover Institution, uh, but we are also a library and archive. So historians come here to do research, uh, and that's how you know books are made, how they, how they write dissertations, that type of thing. So we're one of the largest private archives in the world. Wow. And it's all there at Stanford. It's all at Stanford. It's open to the general public. So if you're interested in uh, 20th century history, we have huge, huge resources and people travel from all around the world to, uh, to check out our materials, uh, to do research, to write papers. So any, anybody with a photo ID can come here and, and do research. For free? For free. Wow. I, so it, and it's not just stuff on Herbert Hoover? Oh, no, no. So a little bit more about the background of our founding. Herbert Hoover, um, back during World War I, he was involved in humanitarian relief. He first started uh, with something called the Commission for Relief in Belgium, which provided the people of Belgium with food, medicine, clothing, all the necessary humanitarian supplies for the duration of World War I. And he became the U.S. Food Administrator. So his job was to distribute surplus U.S. food supplies to Europe. So it's kind of like a Marshall Plan, like what happened after World War II, except this was after World War I. So he gained a great reputation as a humanitarian, uh, potentially saving millions of people from starvation in Europe uh, that was facing great devastation, of course, uh, after the war. But right around this time, he decided to found the Hoover Institution. Then we were called the Hoover War Library, and our name has kind of changed over the years. But his idea was to create a center of historical documentation relating to World War I to, uh, so that we could learn from that conflict. And over the years, we've evolved to include materials relating to war, revolution, and peace in the 20th and now 21st centuries. So we're still like an active library and archive. We collect materials. In fact, there's a family connection for me. My dad, Dr. Matej Shikersky, he's the curator of the European collection here at Hoover. So he travels to Europe several times a year. He has contacts there. And that's one of the ways that we acquire materials that people come use in our archives to do their research, their historical research. Oh, okay. Now, I was reading a little bit about Herbert Hoover on uh, Wikipedia. Yep. And it was fascinating that part of the reason that he got all into relief efforts was because he was like a a millionaire by the time he was in his 40s, right? And he said something like, if you become a millionaire... Before you turn 40, it makes you a much less interesting person or something like that. <laughs> and and that blows my mind. This guy, well, he went to Stanford, right? So uh, he he had his education. And I, I don't want to um, steal all the interesting facts that you could be saying. <laughs> but, but something about how he was like one of the first students at Stanford, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that, jumping back even further, um, so Hoover was from Iowa. He was born in West Branch, Iowa, but he lost both of his parents really early on, so he was sent to live with an uncle in Oregon. And while he was in Oregon, he happened to meet a professor at the then forming Stanford University. This was back in like 1890, 91. Wow. So the professor was impressed by Hoover, suggested he take the entrance exam to Stanford, and he was accepted. So in the summer of 1891, he took a train uh, down from Oregon to Menlo Park, California, since Palo Alto, right next door to Stanford, didn't have a train station back in 1891. So I guess he walked the rest of the way to campus, which was then a big ranch. It was uh, Governor Leland Stanford's ranch that he converted into a university. And uh, Uh Hoover was part of the pioneer class, the first class, but he can also be considered the very first student at Stanford since he was assigned a dorm room over at Encino Hall. It's no longer a dorm, but that's where 
uh, where Hoover had his room. And while at Stanford, he was a mining, uh, he studied geology, which led to his career in mining. Um, he was also the manager of the football team. He was in charge of like selling tickets and making sure they had their equipment. And ah. he also met his wife here at Stanford, uh, Lou Henry Hoover. They both were geologists. They happened to meet in geology lab. I guess they were breaking open rocks or something like that, and they <laughs> fell in love. And then Which they will set happen. off after that to um, kind of engage in Hoover's mining career. He was uh, the manager of a gold mine called the Sons of Gwalia Mine in Australia. He was the manager of uh, coal mines for one of the provinces in China. Uh, so he quickly earned a very good reputation as a manager, and that's exactly like you were saying. He became very wealthy in a short period of time, uh -huh. which allowed him the freedom to kind of engage in, in public service later on um, during World War One, and then further on to his, his public career. And breaking rocks will make you fall in love if you're breaking rocks <laughs> with someone. So just be careful who you're breaking rocks with. Yeah, heavy labor. And he, so back to the football team, wasn't he with the Stanford when they first, like the first game against Cal? He was. And there's this myth out there, I don't even know how prevalent it is anymore, that he was the one to for, forget the football to the big game. Someone <laughs> actually forgot the football to the first big game between Stanford and Cal. But from what I understand, he wasn't even the manager then. I think he was like trying to stop people from jumping over the fence oh. you know, without paying for tickets. So, <laughs> but somebody forgot the, the football. But I don't think he would have forgotten it if that was even his job. And then he becomes our what 34th? First, 31st. 31st president. Yeah. And, wow. So now this was during the time of prohibition, right? So he was the president. Some say... He may have lost the presidency because he was trying so hard to keep prohibition going. Is that is that any you know, evidence on that? I don't know that that was the main. I think it was mostly the the Great Depression. I'm sure the prohibition factored into it. From what I I don't I'm not an expert on his president presidency by any stretch, but I, from what I understand, he didn't really you know oppose um, prohibition, but. Um, he just kind of let it stay. It was there from one of his predecessors, so he, he wasn't going to rock the boat right. and, and change it. And then, of course, the huge uh, economic crisis happened, uh, not that dissimilar from what we've had recently in, in the last four or five years. And that led to him being defeated in uh, by Franklin Delano uh, Roosevelt, FDR, who was the governor of New York. So they were actually pretty good friends back in the late teens early 20s huh. but that friendship really turned south once they became you know political enemies wow. so they actually when they were in the car together when roosevelt had won going to the inauguration they didn't even speak to one another Whoa. since hoover thought it was just really uh he was offended by the way that roosevelt conducted his campaign so he thought it got too personal interesting but didn't he do something with truman uh fdr's vice president that's and, right. And so he was involved with a couple of things. Right after World War II, uh, Truman asked him to go on a uh, mission throughout the world to assess food conditions. So it was a way of kind of capitalizing on what Hoover had done in his humanitarian work back in World War I. And to have him as the representative of the U.S. to kind of assess what uh, conditions were like throughout the world and whether the U.S. could do anything to help alleviate you know, potential famines, things like that. And he also was part of something called the Hoover Commission, which um, gave a lot of suggestions and gave a comprehensive analysis of the federal government and how to better reorganize it, that type of thing. So Hoover was really involved in, in public service as much as, as he was allowed to be. Of course, uh, like I mentioned, him and FB, FDR didn't get along, and FDR was in office for, uh, I believe it was 13 years after Hoover. So there, Hoover really wasn't formally involved in the government for that time. But he was still making a lot of speeches and doing all kinds of um, like newspaper columns and things since he was still really involved in uh, in politics. Ah, okay. Now you have been on television on C-SPAN because you were talking about his wife Lou for the yes. first first wives. Uh, what was it called on C-SPAN? The first wives club. <laughs> uh, first ladies. First ladies. Club. Yeah, it's a series on, on the first ladies of, of the United States. And what are some interesting things about Lou? Well, Other she was than her a cool very, name. Uh, accomplished woman. Uh, she was also born 
in Iowa, uh, although wow. not. Uh, she was from Waterloo, Iowa. So the Hoovers, they didn't know each other until they met at Stanford. But she happened to also be from Iowa. She ended up going to the San Jose Normal School, which is now San Jose State, my ah. alma mater. <laughs> and, um, Interesting. And then she ended up at Stanford, uh, where she wanted to pursue her geology degree. So she was actually the first woman, from what I understand, uh, to receive a degree in geology from Stanford. Um, she accompanied Hoover on his, his travels, so they traveled all around uh, East Asia and Europe and Russia. Uh, she was fluent in Mandarin Chinese uh, when the Hoovers were in China. Actually, there's this anecdote that whenever a uh, English-speaking Chinese person would approach the Hoovers, they would always address Lou Hoover in Chinese and Ho- Herbert Hoover in English, since they knew that his Chinese oh. wasn't as good as, as Lou's. Wow! So, I and mean, that's not an easy language. No, Mandarin. no. Apparently, they spoke that language to one another in the White House when they didn't want someone eavesdropping on their conversations. Wow. Interesting. Huh. So she was she was a, a really interesting woman. She also was involved in Hoover's humanitarian work. Uh, she helped the Belgian lace industry, especially. They're known for their lace. So for, during World War One, she helped uh, facilitate the importation of the raw materials that these lace workers needed and also helped export their, um, their products. So that's just one way that she was involved. She was involved in the Girl Scouts as well. Uh, so she was definitely a very progressive figure. You know, she was supported um, education for, for women, uh, especially she supported outdoor uh, activities for, for both boys and girls. She was herself, she liked to ride horseback. When she was a girl, she'd go hunting with her dad. And uh, the, the story is that she's named Lou. It's kind of an atypical name for a, a woman. But um, the story was that her dad, you know, really wanted a boy, um, <laughs> but got a girl, but he still named her Lou. And she ended up really kind of, I think, living up to whatever he expected his son son would be since she loved the outdoors. Like I said, she loved, you know, climbing up trees and fishing and swimming and riding horses and camping. And even until I believe her 60s, she was still camping, you know, lying on the on the ground in a tent, that kind of a thing. Oh, Wow. What an interesting! Did, did she know the next first lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, at all? Did they get along? I'm not sure what if they had any kind of relationship. I would assume not, since Hoover and FDR didn't get along for like the through the 20s. Oh, yeah, but maybe yeah. they knew each other like a decade earlier. Interesting. Yeah, I saw a documentary about Eleanor Roosevelt, and that was just a fascinating. Her life just so yeah. amazing. Uh, and then uh, Herbert Hoover lived to the age of 90. That's right. So he was, uh, you know, he outlived, you know, sadly for him, he outlived his wife by about 20 years. Wow. Um, he was very active up until the very end. Uh, he wrote something like seven or eight books in the last eight years of his life. So between the ages of about 82 to 90. And this doesn't count several other books he was working on, which I'll mention, too, because it's very interesting. Um, one book, which he considered his magnum opus, his great, you know, written work. And Hoover, I'll just add, he's written, I think he wrote about 20 books or so. So he had a lot lot under his belt. But the book he considered his, his most important was called Freedom the Trade. And the subtitle is, um, you know, I don't have it here in front of me, but it's uh, The Secret History of World War II and its aftermath. I believe that's the subtitle. Oh. And it's Hoover's analysis of World War II, especially from a diplomatic perspective, and his his harsh rather criticism of the U.S. government and how we handled the spread of communism during and after World War II. So it was his like comprehensive analysis of the situation. And it's really interesting from his perspective because he was the president that immediately preceded uh, FDR, who was the president, of course, during World War II. Ah. So it's a really interesting look at World War II, U.S. foreign policy. And that book wasn't um, – the special thing about it is that it wasn't published during Hoover's lifetime. He thought it was way too controversial to release. He didn't want to um, you know, cause his family any troubles by, by creating this big stir with his book. So it wasn't until uh, 2010 that the book was finally edited and published. In the meantime, it had been here at the Hoover Archives in storage – and finally, the Hoover family decided to release it. Uh, so that was just published three years ago. And his uh, other book, which is like his domestic policy book about 
its critique of FDR and the New Deal and all of that. Uh-huh. That is going to be released this December. No and kidding. I don't have so it's finally coming out in 2013. Yeah, and he's been yeah. gone so since 50 19 years since he passed away and since oh, he finished it. 50 years. Yeah. Wow. And it's interesting. So now what can we take from that that he's criticizing FDR so much and he didn't like FDR to begin with. So it's sort of is, do we take do we go uh, sour grapes or? I well, mean, I think it's a matter. We'll have to read it. I haven't. I don't know what is his the case he's going to put out there. Of course, he has a vested interest in defending his reputation. I think um, it's uh, you know history is kind of an interesting thing because it's what what happened isn't always what gets put down in the history books as as what actually happened. You know, it's um, at least as far as Hoover and FDR go. There was a lot of, you can say that the campaign between Hoover and FDR back in 1931-32 was kind of the modern beginnings of of campaigning where you had the public um, outreach, the radio, uh, the print media. It was a lot more engaged than previous elections. And there was a lot of of mudslinging going on as well. And I think that's a lot of the perception of what we have of who Herbert Hoover was, the stereotype of him, you know, being the the reckless guy during the Great Depression or something like that is a result of that successful on FDR's part campaign of portraying Hoover as this inept guy. But if you look at the history, I mean, you can see how much Hoover had under his his belt, how many accomplishments he had. So the, the caricature of Hoover, I think, is inaccurate. I think certainly Hoover deserves uh, blame for, for the things that he did that caused the economy to get worse. But you also have to look at FDR and what his record is in the Great Depression. I think the difference is that FDR was a much better communicator than Hoover. Mm-hmm. Hoover didn't have a lot of experience with um, with radio addresses and, and even public speeches. I mean, he, he gave a lot of public speeches, but he didn't have that compelling um, persona that FDR had. So I think he really uh, lost out in that regard. And FDR being the better campaigner, the better communicator, really outdid Hoover in that regard. But that doesn't mean that idea wise he somehow um you know mastered and and defeated who he was just better uh, he could relate to people better ah interesting on a on a like a on a large uh national stage right but from what i've heard hoover's interpersonal like relationships and everything he were very good I and mean, people respected him tremendously um he was his nickname was the chief which is a nickname that he kept you know until the end of his, his life that's what people called him just because he was you know considered to be the a, a top guy, a really solid manager, someone who who knew how to do um, do what he did well. But unfortunately, history has so far remembered him as the president during the Great Depression. But hopefully, if people are interested, they can also kind of look at his other accomplishments and see that it's a much more. He really was one of the you could say Renaissance men of the 20th century for everything that he accomplished and did and and all that. Just taking politics out of it, so. You know, I think uh, they should make a movie about him with the guy who plays <laughs> Mr. Bates on Downton Abbey. Yeah. I don't know if you've watched that show, but uh, oh. I've seen pictures of Hoover, Hoover and th- th- this actor looks just like him. I think they should he should try and do an American accent, and they should do a movie about him. And you can write yeah. the script. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> I'm putting that bug in your ear. That's a good idea. Nick, what we're going to do is we're going to have a part two to our talk because right. you're a fascinating guy and you know so much. And we'll play uh, part one. Uh, we'll, we'll post on today's podcast and then part two will be on tomorrow's podcast. But because I, I want to ask you about you are a museum curator. You put yeah. museums, pieces and stuff together. I want to add that fascinates me. Uh-huh. And I want to ask you about that and ask you about Poland because you Sounds go to good. Poland a lot. So uh, we'll have more of that tomorrow on Mike's Daily Podcast with Nick Sikirsky. Thanks, Mike. As we go outside of the last place on earth where we bring you Mike's Daily Podcast somewhere in Podcastro Valley, California. And his website, once again, is researchteacher.com. And here's today's podcast picture. Today's podcast picture is of Nick Sikirsky. So you get to see him and he gets filmed and put on TV a lot. He's a big celebrity. 
And he's a smart guy. So see his picture now at mikesdailypodcast.com. Mike and Matthew, oh, he's so attractive. Down, Madam Rutabaga. Calm down. He's okay. You know, I'm in third grade. I have a hard time believing that. Tomorrow, the finale of the Into an Interview with Nick Sikirsky. Plus, we'll hear from Shelley Shuhart, Floyd the Floorman, and John Deere the Engineer. He's a Republican, but not a Tea Party. D. Chris Christie? Yeah, that guy, D. Well, you know, it's up to you. I, you kind of sound like you're from New Jersey. Is that a New Jersey accent? No comment. Yeah, we don't know what our accents are from. Do you know that? Because we don't know that. Oh, it's a mystery. Kind of like where Mike Ockett is going to send me a picture from, what microbrewery he's going to send me a picture from next. Can't wait. Mike's TV Podcast is written and produced and performed by Mike Matthews. His podcast is super easy to find. Download or listen to his show and read his blog at mikesdailypodcast.com. Email Mike now at mikesdailypodcast at gmail.com. See you tomorrow. Bye.